it's a fine line it's a fine distinction hmm? one has to remember the objective the objective of love is the welfare of the other the welfare of the other sometimes the welfare requires that you leave the other to himself and sometimes others welfare requires that you push him a little sometimes you have to let him operate through his personal free will and sometimes you have to nudge him a bit even coerce a little please appreciate that neither free will nor coercion are paramount the objective is welfare if you keep depending on the other to come to a point of realization using his own free will then you may have to wait for really long the wait might even be endless because the mind as we know it is configured for self preservation it may have a thirst for freedom but its habit is to remain confined the mind therefore is stuck in a contradiction and in these two contradicting forces it is not always the yearning for freedom that prevails often the habit for self preservation wins so free will mostly becomes a tool in the hands of self preservation that which we call as our personal will or our personal agreement or our personal consent is but subservient to our tendency to self preserve we may not always realize that but that's what frequently happens we keep saying we will come to freedom when we want to it's a matter of my will my freedom my choice but the reality might be quite different the reality might be that you may never on your own accord by your own choice opt in favor of freedom because freedom is scary to the one who is habituated to confinement therefore a little bit of education on nudging we even said coercion are necessary historically the realized ones have even used the word seduction they would say the unwilling stranger has to be seduced to the province of freedom it is not merely
a simplistic matter of ethics. It is about love. Love is higher than any ethics. And we began by saying that the objective of love is the welfare of the other, the sole objective. The objective of love is not the upholding of ethics. Love does not seek to respect the choices of the other. If the choices of the other are in obvious <coughs> disagreement with his welfare. There are very few kids who want to willingly get vaccinated. You do not wait for their consent. I understand it hurts a little when mature adults are compared to kids. But do get the drift of the example. And there would be no kid who would be on some day or the other unwilling to go to school. You do not allow him to play truant or remain absent just because he doesn't want to. At the same time, if you push him too hard, he may start hating school. So ways have to be found. Wise ways have to be found. Throughout history, the ones who have really loved have invested themselves in finding wise ways, clever ways to bring people to the teachings. There is this poem by Rumi, I suppose. So there was this fellow who was traveling from city to city, giving his message. And when he reaches a particular city, he finds that there is nobody who is willing to listen to him because the people are given to music, entertainment, dance, all kinds of pleasures. So what does he do? He recruits three dancing girls. And with them he moves to the city center. And he has the girls perform an enchanting dance. And a great crowd gathers. And once the crowd has gathered, he says what he has to. And as soon as the crowd is to disperse, the dance resumes. And so on and so forth. The assumption here is that ultimately the message will be so very enamoring that the dancing will not be needed at all. So it rests upon a very tight assumption. The tight assumption is that the teachings are genuine and are emerging from true love. The East is too given to coercion. The West is too sold out to free will. 
In East, if a saint or mystic is speaking, then you have to listen. It is considered a great sin if you avoid or bypass him. If along the highway you come to a temple, you have to bow down. You cannot just ignore the temple and keep walking or traveling. The West says, I will bow down when I want to. There can be no coercion. Human free will is God, the highest truth, the noblest principle. Both of these are extreme and flawed positions. Free will has to be respected, but free will is not higher than freedom absolute. At the same time, truth has a certain pull, but truth pulls in love. Truth pulls to give freedom. The coercion in truth is the insistence of the lover. If you have no love and you still try coercive methods, then you are just encroaching into somebody's inner space that cannot be allowed. A very delicate balance has to be therefore struck. Hmm? What are all these miracles that you read of in the holy books? Huh? Every little saint or fakir has some miracle associated with his name. And there are the miracles of Jesus. What do you think they were? Empty. They were means to bring people in. People don't rise from the dead. Nobody's touch can cure leprosy. Nobody flies on air, nobody walks on water. Nobody can be at 10 different places in the same moment. But we hear of all these things in the religious literature. Obviously, they didn't quite happen. They were made to happen. They were made to happen because there were a lot of people who do not find bland truth attractive enough. But if you can display some miracle to them, then they are quite easily tempted. Oh, something spectacular is going on. Like kids dazed by a magic show. What do kids love more? A hardcore mathematics session in the classroom or a magic show? Magic show. So lovers often have had to perform magic. And you know what magic is. Magic is not real. But even the lovers of reality had to perform unreal magic so that people might be. Stories are to be every in every book that the, the son A and son B receive the person's life. What is the symbolic of symbolic of what? 
what they want to tell us. That real life is that which the saint saves. Please understand. No saint can help you with your biological life. You better go to a doctor. If you have cancer or some other physical ailment, no point rushing to a spiritual teacher. Hmm? Your ailment would merely get compounded. And if you have spiritual teachers who claim that they can cure physical ailments, this claim alone is enough to disqualify them from all kinds of spiritual tags or achievements. But still we keep reading and hearing that the teacher or the saint or the prophet gave somebody a new life. What does that mean? Sometimes it's quite literally emphasized that the fellow was dying and the presence or the touch or the instruction of the saint blessed him with a new life. What does that mean? The collapse of ego. That is metaphorical. We do not really live. We merely exist physically, biologically and in a socially conditioned way. We continuously tremble in the fear of death. Life as we know it is determined by death. And therefore, it cannot even be called life. It can only be called as a projection of death. Take a small proof. If you were not to die one day, would you do any of the things that you currently do? No. All that we do is motivated by fear. The central fear is the death fear. We live from the death center. Remove the death center and most of what we do would be no more done. What does the touch of the saint do? It liberates from fear. It liberates the mind from the identity that is vulnerable to extinction. And therefore it liberates man from the fear of annihilation. We live assuming ourselves to be somebody whose fate is to disappear. Whereas our heart craves for immortality. That's why we fear death so much. That's why we abhor death so much. If death were natural to us, why would we live in a perpetual scare? Breath is natural. Eating is natural. Blinking is natural. When I say natural, I mean biologically natural. Prakritic. Do these bring even a minor ripple in the mind? When you perform your daily biological actions, do they disturb you? Hearing, washing. None at all. Unless you are obviously socially conditioned against biology. One particular society may say 
burping in public places is prohibited. And so you become uncomfortable while burping. But otherwise, nothing, you just live with it. Death, on the other hand, is never a welcome thing, never a comforting thought. But we live with death. Our civilization, our lives, our institutions are all built around death. Therefore, it is not life that we live. It is death that we live. Even our life is defined by its end. Life for us is that time space which we get between a beginning and an end. And nobody likes ending. And if you like ending, then that which you are currently in cannot be likable. If something is likable, you will not like it to end. And if you like something to end, then the thing is not likable. Man is therefore stuck. Hmm? Man is stuck because he takes himself as the perishable one. Contact with a saint leads to a dissolution of man's existing identities. The existing identities are all time bound and therefore vulnerable to death. The touch of the saint moves the mind into an identity that is timeless and therefore deathless. And then begins Life. Life that lives, life independent of death. Life not defined by death. Life not limited by death. That is what is meant when it is said that the touch of the saint gave somebody a new life do not even call it a new life just say life ordinarily we assume ourselves as alive whereas we are just waiting for life we are not really alive we are just waiting for life hmm?